When we think of space, we naturally think of the stars, solar systems, galaxies, the distant reaches of the universe. But space has another dimension to explore, not outward, but inward, into all the basic elements of everything there is on our planet. Here, a miniature world of space exists, a world filled with constant motion, one that went undetected for centuries. It is the world of the atom. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Free Radical Media Podcast. Uh, we have a guest joining us today. Um, well, first of all, introduce ourselves again. Jay. How's it going? Pat. Hey, what's up, guys? And I am Eric. Uh, today we're going to talk to uh, Robert Forte. Uh, Mr. Forte, he um, is the editor of this book, Entheogens and the Future of Religion, among a few others. Um, that we've been discussing amongst ourselves um, for uh, a short period of time here. It's a real interesting, uh, interesting book. It's through Council on Spiritual Practices out of San Francisco. Um, Mr. Forte studied history and psychology of religion at the University of Chicago Divinity School. He's currently adjunct faculty uh, with the California Institute of Integral Studies. Uh, studied under Frank Barron and Stanislav Grof in the past. Um, so we're going to, uh, I guess, really, we'll just start out talking about, uh, we can talk about the book or entheogens in general, and maybe come up with a working definition for the term entheogen, because I think it's a term a lot of people aren't super familiar with. And then, um, you know, uh, the tie into the spiritual practice. Okay. Well, we'll have a lot to talk about. Why don't we start with that word, entheogen. Um, this is a word that was coined by um, a group of people, in, uh, Gordon Wasson, who was a, uh, an important character in this history of psychedelic drugs, Carl Ruck, who was a colleague and co-author with him, and a, an expert, a classical Greek scholar who was an expert on the, um, on, uh, the Eleusinian mysteries and other aspects of antiquity. And um, Blaise Staples, Danny Blaise Staples, his partner and uh, fellow linguist or philologist, I guess, and uh, Jonathan Ott, who's a great independent scholar in the world of psychedelic drugs. And these guys came up with this word entheogen in 1979 because the word psychedelic had become um, so um, burdened with so many associations to things that they considered distasteful. And they wanted to have the conversation about the role of sacred plants in history uh, without that baggage of the 1960s and the psychedelic revolution and the anti-war movement. They wanted to kind of put, they wanted to focus on the, the use of these plants to, um, for spiritual exploration um, throughout history. So they coined this word, entheogen. And... Um, you know, I like the word because I like to have this conversation um, in different settings. You know, there's um, it's such a vast subject, psychedelic drugs, and the ancient historical uses really should be distinguished from the way that they've been used in modern times. So, you know, that's that word. And entheogens is opposed to psychedelic. You know, psychedelic basically meant manifesting the mind, correct? And entheogens is manifesting the divine. Yeah, 
there's a, there are a lot of conversations about this. I personally like the word psychedelic. I like its associations to the 60s. And a lot of the stuff that had begun to happen in the 1960s, possibly attributable to psychedelics, were important. The anti-war movement, a uh, greater sense of more kind of holistic thinking in the culture, uh, a, a spiritual or at least metaphysical uh, worldview began to be rooted in experience. And, um, you know, there were a lot of important things that were going on. Wasson, who was really behind the naming of this word, uh, was, um, you know, sort of arrogant about the 60s. And so um, there's a lot to be critical of, but as I said, you know, I think there's a lot to really gain from understanding it. Hmm. Sure, sure. Well, <clears throat> tell us more about um, tell us more about this collection. I, I think you have a couple of other books too, don't you? That you uh, edited? I did. I published I published three books in the years that I've been interested in this, and they show a certain uh, progression of how I've come to think about these strange drugs. The first one that you mentioned is Entheogens and the Future of Religion, and that's a that's a kind of scholarly collection of writings that um, I collected in a conference that I organized with Stan Groff and then just some interviews with people who were authorities on the subject of, say, meditation. And um, this was done, I began this in the early 1980s when there was like, there was a lull in our culture. There wasn't a lot being discussed about psychedelic drugs. They were, say, sort of gone off the radar. And I wanted to, I was a young, I was a student and then graduate student, and I wanted to do research in this area and explore it in a kind of um, religious context. You know, before when they had come out, they had been explored in a, in a psychiatric context, mm -hmm. and sort of opposite that they were, they were used in the counterculture. There was like this bifurcation kind of of, of the subject. Really conservative psychiatrists got a hold of them and tried to understand their effects in these very limited models, materialistic models, double blind experiments. And that didn't that helped some, but that didn't really get to the to the heart of the matter, in my opinion. And then on the other side, there was like a counterculture and people using them, artists and, and uh, hippies and stuff and using them in their in this kind of, you know, recreational and also spiritual way. But it was. It was kind of unformed. And I just thought that um, when I was coming about in the early 80s, that if we could kind of reframe this subject with an emphasis on the religious aspects of them, then maybe we would be able to, you know, we had this freedom of religion in our culture and we could look at them in, within this setting. So that's what I set out to do. And that's kind of what that book is about. It's, a, it's an argument for... Uh, using these drugs in a religious context in modern times. <clears throat> the next book I did was um, was a book, uh, kind of a feshrift, you know, a feshrift. That's a great word. It's an old German word that means um, festival of writing. And it's, a, it's a, a tribute, an honor to be awarded a feshrift at the end of your career. It's a kind of, it's an academic um, custom in Europe. Uh, so, so I did the Feshrift for Timothy Leary, which was a, a book of essays and tributes, some critical, some congratulatory, some kind of neutral, about the role that he played in the emergence of psychedelic drugs in the 20th century. A very, very complex role that um, I had a kind of, I had a, a, a certain access to, as I said, because Frank Barron, who was my teacher, was Tim's best friend huh. uh, since graduate school. He not only turned Tim on when they were just junior faculty at Harvard, but he was his mentor and confidant throughout his whole life. Oh, and wow. he was also one of the most distinguished uh, personality psychologists of the 20th century, one of the most cited professors at the University of California. Hmm. And so I was lucky to really connect with him when I was an undergraduate. And then we maintained a, a friendship, a, a close friendship, and he was my mentor for until he died in the, in the year 2002. So, um, so he told me a lot of stories. And as I said, he was very much responsible for this thing that we call the psychedelic 
movement that began in the in the really in the 1960s with the popularization of these drugs. Mm. So, um, so I did that book because, you know, at first when I got into this subject, I I was I was sort of um, persuaded by some of some of the literature that said that Timothy Leary ruined the subject. It was Timothy Leary whose excesses encouraging everyone to turn on, tune in, and drop out was, and that was a problem, and that it caused all this recreational use and all these kids, and so the government had to make these drugs illegal because Tim sort of was so flamboyant. That was like the official narrative. Right. Now I bought it at first, and I wanted, you know, although I met Tim right first in you know early 1980s, 1980, 1981, I met him. Um, <clears throat> we were friends right away. I um, but and he understood that, you know, he kind of played that role very deliberately to be a, a catalyst and a revolutionary into a lightning rod and to attract attention and controversy and fame. That's what he wanted to do. Yeah. But most people in psychedelics thought that was a problem because maybe there needed to be a kind of respect and secrecy about these drugs and not be so kind of self-centered and fame-centered. And so um, I bought that. And then, however, after working in the field for a number of years, a decade, I began to instead actually very much appreciate what Tim had done because I saw that the institutions that had attempted to um, you know, control these drugs and own these drugs and push them out through their own frameworks was not really going to work. And there were all sorts of hidden agendas in these institutions that were, you know, government funded and so on. And so Tim was a real, um, real populist at heart and really believed in democracy, and that, that, was a, that there was an inherent uh, chaos about democracy, and he was all into celebrating that. And so yeah. it was a very, it was a very calculated decision on the part of this this inner circle of the psychedelic project at Harvard with Barron and Leary, and and responding to Huxley's point of view and other people that were involved. Tim Tim made a made a, a calculated risk, and you know stood up and and launched this popular um, movement about psychedelics for very deliberate and I think intelligent reasons. And I wanted to do a book kind of in honor of that. Also because I knew that <clears throat> that society, uh, the publishing industry, the establishment media, the state sanctioned press was going to not look kindly on Tim. They were going to put him down and, and and I wanted to show that uh, actually the people that really knew him and understood what he was about loved him and that he was not just a reckless um, kind of corrupter of youth, but that there was actually a very important method in that madness. So that's why I did that book. Mm -hmm. You wanted to provide a different viewpoint, sure. Yeah. And, and bring out the, the kind of political context that Tim had come out in and what was really going on in the 19. 50s and 1960s when this thing started right i mean it was it's almost if uh, could you even think that it would be any other way with lsd entering into the main culture during that political climate and that historical climate i mean it's almost as if that would be the only the only way that it could have unfolded uh when you have such a powerful substance as lsd uh and get, getting into the mainstream well it was um you know, I can't say I have any fixed ideas about it because even, I mean, I lived with Tim. I was kind of part of the team that uh, helped him die. And and I was studying him and collecting all these stories. And he was a very, very complicated, multifaceted guy. And sometimes you'd look at him and he would look like just this crazy old man. <laughs> and sometimes he would look like he was a prophet. And he would glow like a like a saint. It was quite remarkable. And 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 you know, psychedelic drugs dawning on the 20th century in the way that they did is was is really a um, a process that's and I don't think very well understood. And even today, with all of this new publicity, mm. where there's a lot that's hidden. Honestly. Yeah, and I, you know, I find that interesting. <clears throat> Just the the progression from the use of these substances in ancient times, right? 
um, being tied so deeply in with culture, um, with uh, religion, spirituality, right? And then that kind of, that seems to have died during a period of time in history, and now it's in the last 50 years or so, 60 years, having this resurgence. You know, I, I find the zeitgeist of that interesting. Yeah, well, it's important to point out that it died in uh, you know, Western Judeo-Christian culture, sure. monotheistic culture. Sure. Yeah, you know, I, at, when I was in graduate school, I studied with a fellow named Mircea Iliade, who used to make, who wanted to make a distinction between these Judeo-Christian, Christianized Western world and traditional societies and the world, the, the very different worldview that these two um, societies have. And uh, the use of psychedelic drugs and this kind of relationship to nature that the drugs produce was not lost in the indigenous world, in the traditional world. You know, among the, among the world of shamanism in South America and wherever there are traditional societies, they have this kind of proximity to, to nature that is one of the most important characteristics of psychedelic drugs. But you're right, yeah, that they were, they were, they were deliberately um, excised from the culture, it seems, mm. with the with the um, conquests of the of the Eleusinian mysteries in in Rome in the uh, during the Roman Empire and around whatever you know two to four hundred years A.D. that they were really driven underground they were they were not forgotten but they were they were lost to the mainstream they didn't they no longer no longer was the 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 governance of the society informed by these mystical experiences in the way they were during antiquity or the way they are in indigenous societies. And, and Terence and other people have pointed to this as kind of the beginning of the fall, from, um, uh, the beginning of the end of Western civilization, you know, like we lost contact with the sacred, with this, with this realm of being that uh, is where our, where our life force comes from. It's interesting also that, you know, in the new world, um, psychedelic usage w was, was rampant, like you were saying, amongst the indigenous cultures. But then throughout Europe and Asia, I mean, it, it, it's very, very scarce, from, at least from what I've read, of any sort of psychoactive use. I mean, I've heard people saying, oh, you know, there's certain tantric traditions that use psychedelics. Mm. And I mean, of course, there's the, the, the gone smokers of, of, you know, the, the sadhus and all that. But as far as a heavy psychedelic being used within the Buddhist tantrics or the yogis or Chinese Taoists, it just seems like it's very, very, very scarce. Or even within the European esoteric traditions. Yeah, I think that's a good observation. But let me go back to that word you used there, rampant, in traditional indigenous societies. They are they are used there, you know, like if you study the shamanism of South America, of course, and ayahuasca, but they're not exactly rampant because they are, in a way, really more carefully controlled and more it's it's um they're they're sacred. And that, that's an that's a good word here because that means that means separate. You know, they're they're different than all the other plant medicines and a very certain context is arranged for them to be used in and so in that way. But your observation that uh, they're not so much in India, it occurred to me that you could probably maybe show that um, that um, with authoritarianism, with with hierarchical societies, entheogen use goes down. Right. So that like in Europe, where you see this idea that divine, only the, the, the religion was structured so that the access to divinity came through only the very special people that were the priests or the kings, the divine rights of kings. Those guys had the sacred. And if you wanted to know God, you had to go through them. There was a way that they controlled the society. But in indigenous societies, the sense of the sacred is more evenly distributed. Decentralized. Decentralized, exactly. So that's important to look at. I think that's a really interesting observation. Um, uh, would you say, like, now, because it seems uh, even separate from this, there's this call for non hierarchical forms of, uh, you know, human existence, you know? Uh, would you say maybe the resurgence of these spiritual practices 
Um, and these substances are part of kind of a, a shift in consciousness towards something that's more decentralized, non-hierarchical, non-authoritarian. Yes, I do. I think that there, there, but there are a couple of things going on here. I believe that there is, or there is a movement, a, a, a consciousness movement, a natural evolution and um, uh, recognition by the, by the group mind and by individuals tapped into it that we need to radically change the way we've been uh, seeing the world and consuming the world and that psychedelic drugs kind of emerge, unfold, re are reborn into modern society in these synchronistic times with the development of the atom bomb and so on. I'm sure you guys have looked at this and know these stories. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and it's a natural healing, so to speak, of, you know, like ganja flowing into um, America, the United States in the 30s, you know, right in the, you know, this dense materialistic, uh, you know, idiotic culture, you know, comes this healing herb, which kind of turns us on and makes us more in the present moment and less materialistic and more into like quality rather than quantity and things like this. It was like, you see this in nature all the time, that this, there's a natural healing going on. That's one very important thing. But at the same time, there are, there are like, anti-forces and there are people that recognize this natural healing and attempt to co-opt it you know you look at well, this is one of the first things that becomes apparent when you study religion the history of religion is that within the within the teachings of um, of religion in the whole body of religion we can find these beautiful uh healing wisdom and perspectives that that touch us a very deepest core of our being but at the same time there are uh people that use this thirst for religion for apt for the opposite reasons you know and even something like the very the very simple teachings of jesus christ which i believe were written as fiction hmm. that's a very beautiful message that's a nice story jesus was a, is a terrific teacher and philosopher uh, but that teaching has been used as the as one of the greatest forces of genocide and world domination and antichrist so with this this sort of you know dichotomy or whatever you want to call this is also evident in the emergence of psychedelic drugs and it's important to see this you know like the largest purveyor of psychedelic drugs in this last movement beginning in the 50s and 60s is the american cia mm -hmm. of course this whole mk ultra thing and so you know that's important to keep in mind at the same time go ahead yeah, I mean, I, I've heard quite a bit about that within the last couple months. Um, I know there's certain conspiracy theories going around that, you know, all the, the key psychedelic players were, you know, actually involved with the CIA and so forth and so on. And I, I don't necessarily believe that um, at all, actually. But I do feel that, as you said, that the CIA very well possibly could have been trying to co-opt it in, in a different direction. And, and still can be. Um, and I, I think it's just important that, you know, as you were saying, that having that sacred foundation to the usage is of the utmost importance. But my question was, is there a difference between the indigenous decentralized form uh, of the sacred foundation compared to something like the Saint Odemi that actually puts it under a, a sort of orthodox inst religious institution. Yes, there's a very, very, there are a lot of differences between the uh, natural indigenous use of entheogens, or in this case, ayahuasca, with this um, very peculiar syncretic, so-called syncretic cult of uh, the Santo Daime in Ayahuasca. And this is a, this is a wonderful chapter to observe in, in, the, um, in the proliferation of psychedelics in our culture in the Santo Daime church. What, tell me what you know about it. Santo Daime, um, syn syncretic religion of Brazil, along with the uh, Unio del Vegetel, um, basically it was founded, which one was founded by the rubber trapper? Was that UDV or Santo Daime? It was Santo Daime. It was Santo Daime. Although I think, I think you're right. I think both of them actually, uh, were, uh, I think, I think, uh, both of them, the, uh, 
were founded by rubber tappers. Uh, the first, the first one, the Santo Daime, uh, the the one I forget his I forget his name. Um, uh, he was like he was like a seven foot tall black man. Um, I believe that I believe that's the right name. Yeah, he uh, he he first did it with a shaman in uh, in the rainforest of Peru, mm-hmm. and uh, he essentially had a vision where uh, the uh, the goddess of the jungle told him to start a religion off of off of the uh, the ayahuasca in the form of the Virgin Mary, right? Um, I I I I think that's the association they made with it. Right. Uh, but it's a very it's Christian uh, Yoruba uh, tribe of Africa. Uh, a lot of a lot of influences them as well. Um, but the the Santo Daime of Brazil is is a little bit different than the Santo Daime of America. Uh, the Amer the the Brazilian ones. If I if I remember correctly, um, the Brazilian they're they're actually in a process right now where a lot of the children are are sort of moving away from the practice of the of the daime and just and just smoking marijuana and and not wanting to do the the uh, the daime. Whereas in America, it's sort of the opposite. Uh, a lot of youth are are more interested in in you know doing different entheogens. Um, in that case, ayahuasca. Um, but the uh, the most the most interesting part to me about that entire religion is how everyone of the church does daime in their practices. Uh, anyone, you know, adults and, and children, even you know, usually around twelve years old, they start. Uh, that that to me is a is a fascinating thing. Uh, but I mean, what what do you think of the integration of you know, like when when the UDV when they came into America, they won. They they had the they had their ayahuasca uh, taken from them, and then they ended up winning their court case in the Supreme Court nine zero. And to me, that really speaks to the idea of religions being allowed to practice whatever sort of belief system they have. Um, and now the Santo Daime, I don't believe that they ever actually went to the Supreme Court. I know they went to the court in Oregon, and they, you know, they obviously won. Um, but I don't think they ever went to the Supreme Court. What, what are your thoughts on that, as far as the Supreme Court rolling in the UDV case of rolling nine zero? I, I feel like that's a that that says a lot of how they viewed that. Well, I have a lot of thoughts about this. This was. Um just go off on this basic idea here. First of all, um, you know, I was I was given in um, 1984 the corporation papers of the play of a church called the Church of the Awakening, which took um, went almost to the Supreme Court in the 1970s, just the lower court, uh, suing, petitioning for their right to use um, psychedelic drugs as sacraments. And there's a, so this this history of uh, decisions and attempts to create a niche for psychedelic use in the culture is something to spend some time with. Now, uh, you know, the Santo Daime, I have to say, I find, you know, it's a very important chapter, but personally now, I'll just talk about my experience there. I find it a very confusing thing to do because on the one hand, you're drinking this powerful uh, entheogen, ayahuasca, and um, to, to my mind, my experience, what's important about the entheogen is that it gives you the word entheogen, generating spirit within. That's what the word means. And that you take these substances in a context so that you can have direct and unmediated access to the mystery, the mystery of your mind, the mystery of the spirit, whatever mystery, but the mystery, the sacred within. And, and yet you go and it's, and it's uh, you know, it's, so then you go to the Santa Daime church and you are given a, you have to wear a uniform, you have to wear the, all the same color white and you go and you're given this form and the women are over there and the men are over there and the lights are on and you have to dance in a very certain way with these steps mm-hmm. this way and that way. It's like a Catholic church. You're, told when to stand up, when to sit down, 
Um, and then you are, um, you are um, bombarded with these um, songs that they give you that are made up that for their particular church, about songs about Jesus and Holy Mary, Queen of the Force, and all this stuff that these people in the church make up. And there's a whole hierarchy, you know, there's a rating. Thing. It's, to me, it's like putting the, the best and the worst of the history of religion in one room, you know, with a powerful drug. And it's confusing because um, to me, it's a kind of programming. And the, and the Santa Daime is an example of, <clears throat> I'm sure I'll, since you listen to this, have some arguments, but that it's, it's an example of a cult where you have an organization where the welfare of the organization is more important really than the welfare of the individuals in it. They actually exploit in many cases the welfare of the individuals in it. And to me it's a it's it's a kind of it's a very dangerous precedent to, to have. And that it's um <clears throat> that it's again like I'm trying to say the opposite of what psychedelic drugs um, can do to help heal our culture is to get us away from all this wacky kind of superstitious authoritarianism and and uh you know some people have more knowledge than others and and then this christ myth you know like let's get real there's no evidence this guy ever existed this is a crock of malarkey it's been used as a sop on people since the since the i mean have you ever been to rome and look it's like a walmart of religion for god's sakes <laughs> how anybody could have ever taken this seriously is is just, you know, beyond belief to me. Yeah. And now here's the Santo Daime, and so you have psychedelics which are, are you know, they, they require this sincerity and openness and trust of the great spirit and cram it into these, you know, wacky little categories of this church is crazy. And the same with the UDV. It, it, you know, it's, it almost seems like it's not sustainable. Like it almost seems like, like you're saying that it literally is the antithesis to ayahuasca. In a lot of different ways. Yeah, that's what I think. But hey, my ancestors didn't think that um, Christianity would work either. And look how we've been, you know, and imagine like the precedent this could set that we, pretty soon you get the Catholic Church administering, you know, powerful drugs to get people even more hoodwinked into their weird cult or, or, or Zionists or this is this is a terrible precedent. The purpose of psychedelics if we're going to have a revolution and heal our world is to get rid of all these forms and all this crazy shit. Okay. Now that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's a frightening thought. You know, that, that really is a frightening thought. Um, especially with something that has such a great potential to like, uh, uh, your words earlier to be healing, you know, to our society as a whole or our culture, you know, uh, something that has that potential, but I guess it's true that any tool cannot be exploited for good or bad, you know, Look at Char Charles Manson. I mean, he was just one psychopath. Imagine if you gave these things to the U.S. government, what mm. would happen? Good Lord. Well, I mean, sure. And there's even multiple examples of indigenous, uh, what they call bruchos, you know, dark shaman who are using these things for, for malicious intent. So, you know, it, it seems like it might just be something that comes along with the territory, no, no matter what form it takes. Yeah. So anyway, I find it's important when we have this conversation and in the courses that I teach on either on psychedelics or in the history and psychology of religion in general is to, you know, maybe devote one part to the positive effects and the phenomenology of psychedelics and um, and how they work on the mind and what their positive aspects are. And then also kind of look at the other side and look at the ways in which they are used in, in um, for, you know, call it demonic or, or uh, less than wholesome ways. Just about everybody of any significance in the modern story of psychedelics has had um, a, a relationship with the CIA. Frank Barron, who was, as I said, one of the first and most important figures, and Timothy Leary were in the 1950s, when they were graduate students in psychology, recruited by the CIA. Um, this is even before they got into drugs. The role of the, now, now, almost everybody, as I said, now that's not to say that everybody 
Frank was four times offered jobs within the CIA, and it's my understanding that he said no each time. Tim went in and out of the CIA. He used them as much as they used him. Um, <clears throat> in the modern period, people, you know, the CIA monitors this thing. They're into mind control, and they've and they've brushed up against this subject and a lot of individuals and been very intimately involved in it. So that's a that's an important thing not to just brush away. I know that you know these there are there's a lot of stuff going around on Facebook and uh, this fellow Jan Irvin who's a very he's a very controversial guy and stirs up a lot of things and I I've had many many conversations with him and some of what he says is true and at least conforms to my experience but he's um, I believe in many cases you know putting stuff out there that that is um, makes it harder to understand an already difficult subject. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess that is the, the question. To what extent were these government agencies involved with the psychedelic movement and, and their main players? Um, yeah, I, I'm familiar with Jan Irvin's um, basic theory. And, you know, he, he gets into, you know, Terrence McKenna was an ass CIA asset and all of that. And I, I just find it, I mean, maybe... The, Maybe he was unknowingly, but I just sort of find it hard to believe. Yes, well, uh, first of all, let me say I think it's important to separate the subject from Jan's very current and controversial way of doing this. This is, a, this is an inquiry that has been going on since the very beginning. Right? And so, um, you know, Terrence... I find that extremely hard to believe too. I spent a lot of time with Terrence, smoked a lot of joints with Terrence. I was one of the, I was a good friend and supporter of his, and I thought that his, I thought that his, um, his book, uh, the Magic Mushroom Growers Guide, was one of the most important steps in having an authentic kind of psychedelic revolution, which back to the idea of decentralizing these things. You know, here was a way that you could produce in your room if you had if you had a you know a decent skill set and were clean and organized you could produce these very very profound sacraments mm -hmm. and in the process of creating them that was already part of the spiritual process and so to write this book and to you know, and to spread it far and wide I thought that that was brilliant and I became his friend and um, and then he got into more and more into the idea of ayahuasca and had that place in Hawaii. And I, already it seemed to me at this time that this idea of, you know, running down to Peru to bother all those people down there was not the way to go. And he had the idea of transplant, bringing ayahuasca and propagating it in Hawaii. And I thought that was a great idea. And so I supported that considerably. And then, um, but then Terrence made a kind of shift and he began to really disappoint me in the stuff that he was doing and the, things that he was saying and the ways that he was saying them. And he became this just kind of made a lot of the same errors that Tim made. And, you know, this, this kind of uh, narcissistic grandiosity and inflation that is um, just an occupational hazard of exploring these realms. Um, he seemed like a big personality. You know, he seems like a big personality to me. It's, it's similar, you know, similar people. He was a very unique fellow. He was the most articulate, and um, you've heard his tapes. He can that man could talk. Oh, yeah. That was his gift. He was Irish. He was a bullshitter. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he did. I don't know if Dennis wrote about this in the, in his um, biography there, but that uh, I I asked Terrence like, how'd you get like this? Anyways, it's just you're Irish, and he says, well, when he, when they were kids growing up in in Colorado, and like a, you know out in the mountains. They used to go out into the garage and play this game and pick up an encyclopedia and find a subject. And then the uh, and then the then you would go and your job was to make up a story. To persuade everybody in the room that was playing that you knew that, and you could just and you got points for the most believable story, whether or not it was true or not, it was believable. And he used to win. That was that was kind of his early training. And, um, you know, when you really deconstruct a lot of what Terrence said, it, it's, it's a lot of, it's like a poem, you know, it's, it's just important to see him that way. 
And so I don't, I personally, again, I mean, I spent a lot of time with him. We were friends. I don't think that he was a conscious, um, you know, those remarks that Jan Irvin points out about this interview, that's a very interesting story about how he was recruited and, and uh, the, his FBI bus, that's mysterious stuff because this is how COINTEL uh, operators, our agents are recruited. They're pressured into doing this in many cases. Sure. And it, it's not that his story is completely, Irwin's thing is completely unbelievable, but I just don't believe it. Here's what I think though, is that Terrence did, was given permission to operate by MKUltra PSYOP in this country that has a vested interest in seeing a psychedelic revolution kind of be stirred up again because they're in in a sense kind of controlling it and and it and it helps them in their totalitarian agenda and i was just i just put something on my facebook page about this you know it's like if you've read brave new world yeah. right you have a population of people that that are prevented from from any kind of political rebellion because they're so distracted by these visions that they have. They go off and they're given these drugs and, and um, it's what Herbert Marcuse, in his analysis of totalitarianism, if you've read him, calls repressive desublimation. You know, like you encourage your likely dissidents to have a sexual liberation and drug experiences. It kind of siphons off the tension that is necessary for a revolutionary movement. Do you hmm. think, though, that, you know, when you talk about a revolutionary movement, do you really think, though, that the people who will turn to an entheogen or a substance that, that gives them these insights, uh, a lot of times when you have those types of insights, a, it's more of a revolution of conscious than a revolution of going into the streets and rioting and, and things like that, that, that sort, you know, we've seen time and time again, where, you know, someone will riot, a new government will come into place. And then a few years later, they'll riot again. And then another government comes into place. And it's this endless cycle. Um, I feel like the people who have, let me just stop you for a second, because when I use that word revolution, I, I, was not thinking or meaning at all by any means a kind of violent revolution like that. I mean, I mean like a, rev a revolution of consciousness, a spiritual revolution where people uh, take into account their every action. This Buddhist idea of uh, right livelihood and right conduct, mm -hmm. and, um, and that the reason that we are victims of a, a fascist, totalitarian military dictatorship now. Is that we've um, we've kind of lost that we've been we've been disconnected from from this uh, idea of an integrated worldview. Well, then, in a lot of ways, you know, when you think of uh, you know, when a person takes a substance like this and they have this profound experience where it, it allows them to see the world in in this sort of different way. Um, it, to me, it's it's about there. There's not a lot of voices that out there to my knowledge, who are able to articulate in the way that a lot of those big figureheads of the 60s were, where they were able to gather people together and and sort of and encourage and inspire people to, to have those types of experiences. Uh, it, it, it seems to me a lot of today, uh, a lot of these substances are wrapped in the partying type of culture. And I, I feel personally, I think that culture is extremely destructive, more so than than any type of a, of a misuse in the 60s was. I think that's a very important thing that you're saying. And I feel I feel very much the same way. It's, an, it's interesting and important to look at the difference in political sensibility in the movement, the psychedelic movement in the 60s and the psychedelic movement now and, you know, this is, again, part of my reason for praising Tim in the ways that I do. You know, he didn't just popularize psychedelic drugs. He popularized them with very specific memes, sayings, context, set and setting mm -hmm. that were meant to wake people up. He said, turn on, tune in, drop out. Right. Mm -hmm. And he said he, he also was urging people to question, re question authority. Mm -hmm. and he, made, he made very, very uh, many speeches about how 
the institutions and the media were out to mind fuck you and that we needed to turn on to this to drop out of all this attempted socially constructed reality that was being foisted on us by our religions by our schools by our teachers by our parents and look within and create a new world this was what these were the memes that he was putting out and that's why he was slammed and put down and put in prison and discredited and there's a series of books and magazine articles about what a trivial figure he was when he was actually had his finger on the psychological programming that America was being subjected to. And, and this is something that if you guys want to study this stuff, you should know about Operation Mockingbird, which was the first very large extensive program of the CIA to take over the media, take over universities. These are Nazi totalitarians coming in from Europe, from Germany, and beginning to do what the Third Reich had done to Europe, only on another optic, you know, a smarter, a kinder, gentler way, as George Bush put it. And Tim was, this is what he was recruited to do, spy on Americans and begin to, you know, control the mind. And he said, no fucking way, man, I'm not doing that. Hmm. And so um, the modern, and then there was this, this period where the drugs were not very much in the media. And then it started to come up again with the advent of MDMA in the early 1980s. And this is, again, something that I was very much a part of. Uh, and I watched it go from this secret drug that was used and had really profound effects when used in a certain sacred quiet context and then within just a few years it's the most popular recreational drug in the world it's being used in these rave kinds of environments with uh, warehouses of 10,000 people yeah. and young young people just and all the positive it seems to me all the positive effects of MDMA are which your intimacy and communication with yourself and other people are drowned out in this monotonous kind of trance music and huge doses and dancing instead of it being an intimacy with yourself it's a it's something else and it and um and then the political sensibilities of this whole generation now we've seen 20 years of this stuff almost 30 years of this stuff uh and and yet as you're saying i forget your name is um okay. is uh <clears throat> And this has bugged me for a long time. And I, the, the first book that I did, I was, I had, you know, meant to publish it. Originally, was going to publish it about ten years before that. But I could see this thing happening, and people would use this religious history of psychedelic drugs as a rationalization or an excuse, sort of, for the more, um, you know, kind of adolescent and just recreating some of the mistakes of the 60s and i didn't want to be a part of it you know that's really interesting especially you know like you, know, you look at like the the pepsi motto of today live in the now you know just just party you know just just have fun and that mdma culture has made a resurgence so you know especially we're talking about the rave scene of the 90s the rave scene has come back even more so today especially with that techno music and it is you know the the intimacy of of conversation seems to be being taken away you know social media is supposed to be this great interconnectivity it feels as though it's the complete opposite and the rave scene feels like it's the complete opposite of of a group setting you know if if, if i'm going to compare it to something you know i guess we could we could look at like woodstock or or, or festivals of, of that nature in the in the 60s and gatherings like that in the 60s where you know it was about you know on connecting on individual levels with people in the rave scene is more of this you're you're sort of, you're being controlled through the music and it's taking you on the journey that the person who's creating the music wants to take you on and it's it's very similar to to a type of a mind control almost and who's behind that stuff you know who's behind the uh propagation of those drugs you know if one was going to I, you know, I, I would, I, I don't know, are people looking into this, you guys, you're in college, or people are writing papers about this, and... Uh, well, I, I've observed personally at certain, <clears throat> within the festival scene at least, you know, people, they take these anonymous white powders that they believe to be MDMA, and they have no idea what's in it, they don't bother to test it, they don't bother to even question it, they just pop it in their mouth, and, you know, a couple hours later, go hunting for another anonymous white powder, 
And you know that 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 question has arisen multiple times. Who's distributing this stuff? Who's bringing this stuff in? Who? I mean, obviously it's connected with black markets. Um, obviously it's connected with with probably fairly large drug cartels. And there's a whole host of shady undercurrents that are most definitely involved with it. And I think just that general awareness needs to needs to propagate itself. It seems to me, from my understanding. Um, that there's a deep web of connections between, um, you know, the black market drug trade, financial institutions, corporate entities, and, you know, of course, state governments, state actors, you know, and it's like this, uh, web of, you know, we talk a lot about just the general capitalist system, you know, the neoliberal global system, and it's so interconnected at these top levels just through money right through essentially the profit motive and the greed you know obsession um and of course you know the maintenance of power like you were saying earlier you know it reminded me of noam chomsky's manufacturing consent um the use of soft power and media to maintain forms of control without having to use force you know and it feels like this might uh, in some aspects be another means of doing that you know you know, there's been there's been some uh, people have written about this in terms of uh, heroin, of course, and cocaine. You probably know these books. A very important book by Alfred McCoy, uh, who's now a professor at the University of Wisconsin, I believe it was his Yale dissertation called "The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia," mm. which was about the, the the proliferation of heroin during the Vietnam War and to the great extent that it was CIA psyops that served multiple functions would 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 develop uh, you know huge supplies of cash for covert operations and would also destabilize the the neighborhoods of potential dissidents they wouldn't be able to politically organize because there you know there's this chaos introduced by the heroin epidemic and then uh, and then subsequent research of a similar phenomena in South in um, Central America, the, the, the invasions of Central America with uh, the cocaine trade. And that was Gary Webb's one of Gary Webb was one of the researchers. And this is very, you know, you get Gary Webb was killed for writing that book. Right. And, you know, you don't want to get too far into this stuff, really, unless you're unless you are, it's, this is one of the <laughs> parts of the totalitarian society that we live in is that there are a secret police, you know, and there are certain things that, that are um, dangerous to get into. Uh, there's an interesting fellow, Leonard, Leonard Picard. Do you know his story? Sounds really familiar. Yeah, no, I don't believe we do. Um, well, he's serving, he's serving two life sentences consecutively at uh, Leavenworth prison. You can Google him. I don't want to talk too much about that, but he was um, he was one of the largest LSD manufacturers in history. Hmm. Fake story of uh, this is a lot of it's been published that he was uh, he converted or was invited to make LSD in some nuclear weapon silos in Kansas, which were changed and turned into drug laboratories. And it was the largest LSD laboratory in the world. He was busted in 1993. I actually have heard that story. I, yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. That's interesting. There was also an enormous supply of uh, MDMA coming from there and those people. And one of the people that worked in that was a woman named Crystal Cole. Mm -hmm. who wrote an interesting book called Lysergic. Which talks about tells some interesting stories about how and to what extent that was a government operation, and how they were protected a couple of times by uh, by feds when they were busted by local cops. Wow! So you know, if someone wanted to do some do some research, they would look into that. Um, Leonard actually came out. This is on Crystal Cole's website, which is called NeuroSoup. Uh, that that Leonard had in his uh, sentencing hearing said uh, told all this stuff about his involvement with CIA and everything and that's a really interesting story. There's a, a lot of rumors as well um, that uh, the CIA is still heavily involved in the heroin trade through Afghanistan. Well, 
Yes, rumors. No, there's, there's, um, it's, it, it should be obvious that this is what's going on to people that have looked at the history. I mean, actually, the same individuals that were involved in the Vietnam scenario and then in Central America are, you know, in positions in the State Department with, with Afghanistan now. And as we, you know, the more we're in there, the heroin is now flooding our cities again. And, uh, mm. and this is James Mills. That's an important book to read for scholars in this field. The Underground Empire. It was, I think it won a Pulitzer Prize for that book about how there's there's more money in in underground illegal drugs than in anything else. More than weapons, more than energy. They're, they're, most of the money is in, in in the history of this, of course. And, and so let's be honest. And, and psychedelic drugs are not immune to this. This is um, this is a very much has, has to be seen in, in terms of what's going on in the psychedelic community, I think. I, I, I agree. And honestly, I'm glad we're having this conversation because um, there's a lot of stuff out there about the positive uses of, of, of these things. And I, I believe strongly in, uh, in in tapping into uh, spirituality in that manner and to use these things in a responsible manner, right? But there is a dark side to everything, right? I mean... Tim, Tim used, you know, this is like, it's like sexuality. We all know that lovemaking is the most sacred, one of the most sacred things that we do in our life and precious and we're quiet about it. And then there's pornography and the sex trade and, and there's all this, you know, so you have to separate what you're talking about as i said before the phenomenology of mysticism that we can understand using psychedelics and that's one thing and then the exploitation and uh commercialization and misuse and opposite from mind control instead of mind expansion there's a very big shift to this to this area so my, we were talking about my books at the beginning my i did that i did the book on leary because i wanted to just look at and talk about his method of doing things, which was public and democratic. And then I decided, you know, that wasn't right either. And I wanted to go back and look at Wasson's life again, the opposite of this. And 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 it, and his book, the the uh, Road to Eleusis, which is the which is the book that kind of um, puts out was the first book really to put out that the secret ingredient of the Eleusinian mysteries was maybe derived from ergot in a primitive but effective chemistry to isolate the LSD. And um, I thought that was important that there were parts of the Eleusinian story that were very relevant to today. First of all, it's a story, the taking of the, L of the sacrament is part of the story a reenactment of a myth that where we're approaching the end of the world, right? Wow. If you remember that, it's Demeter, the goddess of the earth, is grieving over the abduction of her daughter. She's and she's about to end. She's about to die, and with her death, the earth will perish. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> and Hermes comes in and plays a little trick, and they get Persephone released, and so Demeter, Demeter is joyous and that's the story and she leaves behind the sacrament this kiki on this drink that people are supposed to take once a year only once a year you only take it once in your life and you take it at this in this way that you are not allowed to talk about it so it's like the utmost secrecy and sacredness of this consumption and vision and i thought i just wanted to you know, I like call some attention to that and put that out there into the conversation that here's another model for for entheogen use. And it also had we were talking before about the, the court cases, the um, see, in the night in 1974, the Church of the Awakening. Petitioned the court because see, Native Americans were allowed to use peyote and this church got together and said, this is discrimination against white people. If, if Native Americans can use peyote, why can't we use peyote? And the court, in this completely idiotic ruling, came back and said, well, the Native Americans have this in their history. 
This is not something they're just making up. They've been doing this for hundreds of years, said the court. And there was no history of this among Western Judeo-Christian society. So, you know, it's kind of contrived. And so a couple of years after the court made that ruling, Wasson and Hoffman wrote this book, The Road to Eleusis, which completely counters the court's argument. In fact, psychedelic mysticism is at the very core of the origin of Western philosophy and Western religion. Plato and all of these great minds of in the, in the great vision of Western Greek culture were, many of them said this was the most important event in their life, that their consciousness was expanded, they no longer feared death, they had a vision of the cosmos and all these mysteries, you know, unfolded. And many discoveries, you could go on about everybody said the, the experience at Eleusis was the most important of their life. And that was all they could say about it, you know. So it was like the secrecy of it kind of added to the power. And that was, um, I put that out there again in a couple of different editions to counter what I saw as a, an emerging profanity of psychedelic drugs, as we're talking about. And it's interesting too, you know, when you think, uh, when you take a substance like this, you you obviously, you have these profound experiences on them. And in this Western society that we live in, it seems oftentimes very difficult to be able to integrate these types of experiences into this consumerist lifestyle that we live in. Um, you know, oftentimes people when they when they find out that you do some of these substances they 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 look at you as if you're crazy and i feel that that is a very ostracizing and it and it sort of uh it makes a person feel closed off and and it and a lot of times it has a lot of negative effects on on a person being able to incorporate these these experiences properly into their lives and, and, and to enrich their lives live in a culture that is, um, uh, as you say, you know, consumeristic and materialistic and pulls us out of ourselves. We, we live in a really sick society. And to the extent that uh, visionary experience wakes us up to that, we have a problem about, uh, you know, now what do we do? You know, that, I mean, um, Timothy Leary wrote a very important essay that might help illuminate some of this in his in his book. And it's the essay is also called The Politics of Ecstasy and how mystics throughout history, this you know relationship of the mystical worldview to the society. Mystics generally live outside of the society. You know, they live in monasteries. They live there. This is um, this is how history has been. And. Um, and so, well, as, as you said before, you know the the whole idea of this of this revolution um, to tear down the structure of the society that we live in today can only truly be done by incorporating these experiences that you have on these types of substances. And really, you know, at, at its core, a lot of these experiences that that are that are had on these substances. Um, to me, it, it almost seems like common sense, really. When you once you once you really just sit down and you break down the the experiences that you have, um, the ideas on, on how to to change culture, it, it I don't know if maybe that's because of of the uh, the simplicity that a lot of these substances make a lot of these profound experiences seem like. Um, but you know, to if we're going to change society for for the better for the for everyone, um, I I don't I I personally have yet to figure out a way in which we can incorporate these experiences into society without having to essentially just tear down the the modern Western world and the way it operates. I I don't see. I don't see a way how those two societies could could live side by side in in a way in which that's sustainable. Well, I'm sure that that's going to be a question that will engage you for a long time. And uh, again, you know, we suffer from a, 
a, what I call a crisis of legitimacy in the modern world. And um, it's, a, it's a very crazy place. You know, it's a country that masquerades as a democracy and isn't. It's a very dire political crisis that has been was foreseen you know, decades ago by, you know, whatever, Aldous Huxley and George Orwell, to name just two, mm. foresaw this kind of thing happening. And then when you, through psychedelics or any other way, begin to pop your head out of that, and there's this, again, P Plato, Plato wrote um, The Allegory of the Cave. Right. About this same kind of philosopher's dilemma here, and um, you know, you guys at your age, you just have to go easy and make sure that your own local realities are are uh, up to speed, and that you're, you know, you, you can't really change the world. You can only you can only really live in a sane way, and that that will change the world. And, you know, not to try to get too far ahead of ourselves and just, um, you know, take care of the here and now. Sure. And, and I definitely agree about taking care of, like, your local area, right? We, we talk a lot about activism. Um, and a question that I ask everyone is, uh, what do you think that we can do? Because the first step is education and conversation, right? The second step is necessarily action. What do you think we could do to harness these philosophies, mysticism, spirituality? Um, what do you think that we could do in our communities and just as a community as a whole in this country, in this world, to try to improve things? I pick out, you know, one thing at a time. So you guys are in Ohio. I I'm personally have thrown myself into uh, hemp and cannabis mm -hmm. and the potential of this... Uh, easy to grow um, power plant that has so many uses that can help us become um, more independent and free of the, cor the, the corporate establishment that really is draining our resources and our soul. And uh, Ohio, I don't know what they're, what's going on there with medical marijuana or then I know that, you know, years ago, Ohio was agriculture was probably centered on hemp and it was one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And, um, you know, what's happening there? Well, uh, uh, I think currently the state legislature is, um, they have some bills up. They, they have consistently put bills up for recre or, uh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. medicals, uh, the medical use of cannabis. Uh, those have never fared well. But it seems in this current round, um, it does better every time. Let's let's put it that way. But it never makes it to a direct vote. Um, you know, we we are a referendum state, but that's never been put up as a referendum. Um, but I think they're also kicking around recreational bills this year as well. Um, well, those are that's a that's a political drama that is potentially very fruitful for intelligent people to get involved in. That's you know, we're seeing now the the shifting of this from pro, from the prohibition to some sort of context. What what shape is it going to take? Is it going to be controlled by big corporations? Uh, are the really wondrous medical healing properties of it going to be kind of overshadowed by this? recreational, you know, selling of it, um, what, what context is that going to take? Another thing about, you know, you asked me, I take that question seriously. I'm, I, um, I don't have a lot of confidence in, um, big change happening to the institutions. I'm, I'm more these days encourage people much like Leary did to, um, create your own little scenarios, the permaculture movement is a very, very profound, deeply revolutionary, uh, really important way to reform your worldview and to become self-sufficient and look within and, and again, detach, to drop out of this, this you know, military madness that... that uh, that seems more and more to be the most viable solution to me personally, is that um, if you limit how much you interact with these big institutions um, and instead are able to pull yourself out and, and do it, do things yourself. 
within your own communities with groups of people, um, it limits the power those institutions have over you and, and others, right? You know, don't pay your taxes. Just turn on, tune in, drop out. You know, leave all that stuff behind. They, they're like a parasite that can only thrive on people's willing participation in it. And grow your own food, you know, just just ignore that. They're, they're, um, it's crazy, you know, be lucky that you don't have to go fight in these crazy wars and that, uh, you know, be creative, look, generate from within, you know, be artistic, be musical, find, find other ways to be joyful without that stuff that's being generated by that madness out there. But I'm, look, I'm noticing it's 720. I'm going to have to hop off here now. We can uh, we can talk again sometime. Give me a call whenever you want. Awesome. Sounds great, Thank Robert. Thank you so much. Yeah, we appreciate your time.